So we are just going to quickly cover in 25 minutes as best I can some major things that you can be looking at uh, for the intermediate term type of positioning, which is a question that I seem to be bombarded with a lot. And, uh, you know, one of the key things when we look at a further time frame out is frequency of occurrence. So I hope that you all take this to educational value, take it to heart for the educational value because uh, part of this opportunity has passed in this particular uh, environment, but it should be in incredibly uh, instructional going forward and uh, as well give you some good tips for relative strength tricks, okay, which is a huge component these days in a momentum driven uh, environment. So let's just look at five quick ingredients here that set the conditions for truly buying and selling opportunities on a portfolio basis. This is classic. If you read my Trading Sardines book, you will see this is the very first thing that I reference because it was put forth by, if you guys remember the elves on Wall Street Week, the elves used as their primary components momentum, sentiment, and monetary conditions. So the middle three uh, indicators here, momentum, sentiment, and monetary conditions, and the elves had a win percent rate of 90% over a 10-year period. So pretty respectable. And I think things got a little bit sloppy when they sort of changed the formulas and a lot of the monetary condition, um, things were measured in different metrics. But with that said, I always fall back on momentum, sentiment, and monetary conditions. So we're gonna look at those in several different environments. Now, as you guys well know, context is everything. And so I put up here a daily and a weekly chart, swing charts, because that is how I quantify the market structure and look at things in context. And so I just wanted to point out this previous period in history because we will make some comparisons. And before we had that huge liquidation downfall in part aggravated by derivatives uh, 12 years ago, you can see that this weekly chart was putting in shortened swings to the upside. And also you can see that this was a year long process here. That's normally what distribution is a year long process and accumulation and distribution patterns are the longest time horizon for holding periods. In other words, that's what generates the um, opportunities for a portfolio based long time horizon on the uh, short side or the long side. And in particular here, it was on the short side. So we are not looking out that far for this webinar presentation. We're looking down at a slightly lower time horizon, perhaps a couple weeks or more. But the first and foremost important thing is any indicator, whether you're looking at a directional oscillator such as a stochastic or sentiment readings or momentum readings, all are extremely dependent on context. Are we in an uptrend or a downtrend? And so here you can see on the daily charts, we were indeed in a downtrend before that whole debacle unfolded. Now I fast forward to our current structure of this daily and weekly charts. And indeed you can see that there was no distribution on the weekly charts or the daily charts adding credence to the fact that this was truly an outlier one-off type of event and had nothing to do with classic technical indicators and distribution or accumulation or these other types of metrics. So the context in the last uh, year was entirely different than the context that we had on the previous downturn and you will now see why. 
So what started this deep dive, okay, into this type of uh, looking at internal indicators and, uh, you know, positions as to where we are now. This is CQG, and this line chart at the bottom simply is uh, the closing tick readings. It was just the best way that I could display that. And I started to notice this little bit of an aberration here in the middle of March, premature for sure here, but I had not seen a closing high tick reading of uh, better than 700 all through the month of 2019, excuse me, the year 2019, other than the month of January. So this right away caught my eye. This was extremely unusual. And then I really started to investigate closer once we started seeing these multiple closing tick readings, which were in very, very unusual. We had not seen such high tick readings since 2014. In fact, there were no high tick readings in the month of, two, excuse me, in 2019 other than one at the beginning of January. So now this is going to uh, start us on an adventure looking at market breadth. And ticks are extremely highly correlated with market breadth. So let's just look at this in a little bit more detail. And I wanted to start back a good 13 years ago and show what real distribution and real tops look like from a market technician's standpoint, okay? This is classic technical analysis without the advent of any outliers. And the first thing I wanted to say is that on this bottom graph, I simply have a 10 period simple moving average of the closing ticks. And I overlaid on top of that a long-term Bollinger Band type of reading, a standard deviation function centered around 100 period simple moving average, just for a crutch for our eye to see the extremes. As you all well know, in a trading range environment, we can use an oscillator such as a stochastic to alert to overbought or oversold conditions. And that is normally how I like to use the ticks. I keep track of a five and a 10 period simple moving average of the closing ticks. And I use them as one would use a stochastic oscillator for overbought and oversold. But all of you are much smarter than that. And you know that if you are trying to fade an overbought stochastic reading, there are times that you can get annihilated. And so that is what we are going to look at in this particular webinar is context, trading range versus momentum and some different examples you can apply going forward. So easy to see that every time here, these ticks pulled back below the standard deviation band, it was like a continuation pattern, like a bull flag, like buying dips in a market. And it looks so easy for establishing intermediate term positions in stocks. In fact, there's nothing more we have to do for the rest of our life until we hit this little slip in the ice down here on the right hand side of the chart. And you also should all know that we do not buy the first dip after a momentum cell divergence. And so that is what this tick indicator shows here, this slow deterioration in the closing tick readings. All right, so right off the bat, I want you to observe how unusual it would be through all this period here to have a closing tick reading of greater than a thousand. And in this case, we use the ticks as a momentum that is going to um, lead to lower levels. So that led to this whole debacle here, extreme sell-off, extreme sell-off until this data point right here. And what was unusual about this data point right here, in addition to the fact that we had a closing tick reading above 800, was that this also coincided with a breadth 
thrust indicator, which I am going to detail out for you in just a few slides. So the importance of that is that, uh, goodness gracious, I am sorry, I can't talk right now. So the importance of that is that there are some times when ticks, as you can see right here, for example, are overbought and can signify time to exit those positions. And there are other times where the ticks give such a powerful thrust up that it is called a breadth thrust. And that, folks, can be the beginning of a bull market. Okay, so always two sides of the coin, and it all depends on context. And the most important thing with the breadth thrust, and I'll show you the formula shortly, is that it swings from this deeply oversold condition to a overbought condition, if you want to look at it that way. So over here on the right-hand side of the chart, we had a second breadth thrust reading in 2011. And as a proxy, our 10-day moving average of the closing ticks went from oversold to overbought in an extreme way. And we'll look at the precise way to measure this. At this point here, could you have foreseen what was coming? Okay, so it's telling you to go long right here, but by all conventional uh, measures, your, your mind is going, why? We just rallied all the way up. This should be perhaps a shorting opportunity and fill out range. And what you will see is sometimes the best buying and selling opportunities do not come from oversold conditions. They come from either neutral readings or almost overbought conditions. So I'm trying to expand your horizons with this webinar. So going back now, you can see 2011, that same breadth thrust by signal. And look what it led to. So it's truly a momentum type of indicator. You can Google it and read it on the internet, uh, you know, a million ways up and down, and it's going to serve you to really study this in light of context as well. Overbought or oversold in a trading range versus new momentum indicates the start of something bigger. So all of this is still background information for the nitty gritty that I'm going to get into. You can see here, this was almost like a breadth thrust indicator in 2014 here, simply because we came from this deeply oversold flush down and rallied back up. And the market in the last decade has a propensity for making more V spike reversals than ever before in the past. Now, you can see our current slide, our current environment. What the heck? Look at this. This is a 10-day moving average of the closing ticks. We have not seen anything like this for ages and ages. So truly, the smart money was coming in here I've never seen anything like this going all the way back, except for a little bit of a period here in 2017. And of course, this 2019 spike that you see on the chart here was actually only generated from one data point. It was one extreme high closing tick reading that pulled this whole moving average up. It's a 10 period moving average. So I want you to recognize, yes, we had an absolute aberration to the downside. And I'm sure there was some technical basis for it somewhat because you can see the ticks through 2019 totally lackluster, totally. In fact, it's rumored, so I heard, that a good part of the buying had come from share buybacks and extraneous sources and not the speculative fever that we would have expected fourth quarter of 2019. 
because nobody seemed to get too excited about this rally. And we'll see that on the sentiment readings very shortly. But this was totally insane. So all the data that we've looked back at so far, we had not seen any closing tick readings like this in the past 14 years. So let's just check now at this breadth thrust indicator. Okay, and uh, we can see, first of all, it was originally developed by Marty Zweig. It's a momentum indicator. So overbought can lead to more overbought. Um, there's a little formula for it here. I suggest if you're interested in this, Google it. There have really only been three or four signals in the last uh, six or seven years. So another thing that we see is that sometimes the ripest opportunities have a low frequency of occurrence. All right. Uh, and this just is a little bit more stuff that you uh, can Google and read for yourself. I did not plot here the true breadth thrust indicator because I want to make it simple for you guys. Um, instead, I plotted a 10-day moving average of the NYSE breadth and a 10-day moving average of the NASDAQ. And what I want you to notice here is quite early on, quite a number of years ago, and you guys all know this as well, we started to see an increasing divergence between the old traditional economy and the digital economy, as I will just call it for a gracious way of saying technology. And you can see here, fourth quarter of 2016, we did indeed have a quite a significant uh, pop up in the breadth for the NASDAQ. We didn't really see it in the NYSE. We did see it in both indices coming off this 2019 low, right? And then look at this last we quasi breadth thrust reading, depending on which set of parameters you are using, NASDAQ or NYSE. And you can see here, this was actually a couple weeks ago. So uh, right off the bat, it's telling you that you had this strong thrust reading in the NASDAQ uh, breadth. We just didn't quite see it in the same way in this NYSE breadth. Moving on, okay, I told you I can cover a lot in 25 minutes. So moving on, we've got this moment, um, the sentiment readings I'm just going to give you two. You can study this for yourself. AAII, investor sentiment, and the put-call ratio. I can live with just these two sentiment readings. I don't need a whole lot more. And what I want to point out to you is that before we fell out of bed, there was no market toppiness. There was no frothiness. There was no excess. The fat lady was not singing. Historically, when we see tops, you're more likely to see this type of reading in the AAII. Now, this was just the latest readings. How freaking bearish are we? Okay, so when you have such bearish sentiment, it tells me there's still cash on the sidelines. And let's just put this in a historical perspective here. You can see, okay, we have been more bearish in the past, but where are the bulls for this entire rally? I mean, how many new highs do we have to make, old time new highs, before there's any believers? It defies logic, because face it, we're going to be in a depression for the next couple years, right? So goes the conventional thinking, and that may well be. But does that have anything to do with our trading? Absolutely not. Here is the put call ratio. I only like to use the put call ratio for listed stocks. I don't really care for it when you start including the OEX and indices. There's a little bit more of a hedging factor. But suffice to say, this reading here of 1.30 was really extreme. 
So that's the other thing I like, are the put-call ratios in addition to the AAII. Now remember, we had five variables coming into our webinar. We had this market structure, the momentum readings, the sentiment readings, and the next factor is monetary conditions. I want you guys to see something that is a real eye opener. Everybody likes to focus on M2 because that is a traditional precursor to inflation, okay? Uh, you guys can all reference this later. And of course, everybody knows that the Fed has done an unprecedented $3.9 trillion in asset purchases, but let's just also look at the M0, which is cash. This is cash, cash, and pure cash, and it's called heroin for the markets, okay? So you just gave these markets a huge heroin injection here. And if I put it in historical context, looking back, you can see the rate of change for this heroin injection has never been seen before. So you've got that going for you. And if I just throw up the traditional M2 measurement of money supply, you see that's crazy too. So why isn't our economy on fire right now? And that is because there's these other variables like the velocity of the money and how quickly it gets passed from hand to hand. And when things are shut down, that completely halts the velocity of the money, so to speak. But this now is all built up in the pipeline and it's probably going to manifest itself in financial asset inflation. So last ingredient, we know that we have the monetary conditions with the sentiment conditions and the momentum conditions and the structural conditions. How do we decide which horse to ride? Let me tell you in three minutes, several different tools for relative strength. Okay, and this is the most important ingredient of all. It doesn't behoove you at all if you pick the wrong horse in the right race, okay? Instead, we're going to go down, and the first thing I want to point out to you is a system that I created with Steve Moore, MRCI, and actually, I have to give him the credit for this, for showing it to me. What I want to show you at the bottom of these charts is a 21 period stochastic and you can develop a very simple system with a stable of horses where you take the top three most overbought and stay long those and one of those drops out of the top three most overbought then you drop it out of your portfolio and you replace it with the next most overbought. Now, doesn't this defy your traditional logic of technical analysis? But if you think about it in the context of that breadth thrust indicator, it also can be a powerful momentum indicator. So I wanted to compare the S&P on the left side of the chart Gilead Sciences, just because it got a lot of publicity and was in play with an increase in volatility, and then Shopify. And what happened when Shopify hit this? It was 100%. You see, the stochastic was buried at 100 up here for a couple consecutive days. So if I had added this to my portfolio right at that time, because the stochastic hit 100%, I would have been in a far better place than if I had bought some other crud that didn't move. So that is the power of relative strength. It tells you the biggest supply demand imbalance. As an aside, I also overlaid a three period RSI because there have been a lot of misconceptions as well about when a three period RSI hits an overbought reading, it is due to retrace. And I want to show you that you better damn well respect that freaking momentum because it is not a fade trade if you put it in the proper context. In fact, 
in this particular case, you can see how the overbought got more overbought, got more overbought, got more overbought, right? Okay, so do respect these things and place them into context. Now, I'm going to show you a couple other tricks with relative strength. This was the reading at April 8th, and I just wanted to compare Apple, which has been on fire for sure. I like Apple versus Abbott, which has been dogging it here, and the S&Ps. But I was looking at this data point that is highlighted by this particular line. And indeed, you can see our stochastic popped up here to almost 100. It was well above 90. And the RSI was overbought. And at this time, I posted this chart to Twitter saying, how many people think that this is going to make all-time new highs? And I didn't get a very enthusiastic response. But it was simply based off of this system. Okay, I'm not a genius to know what stocks are going to perform best or not. Anything far from it, you know, but it was simply based on my little system that I run off TradeStation. And it said that this had popped up to the top of the list and to be long this one. Now you can also see at this point it rolled out of those top performers and you would simply drop it from your portfolio and perhaps then go into a long apple when it popped up here. You see, it's a rotation game and it just depends on how hot of a potato you want to treat in your portfolio. But uh, this was also uh, the RSI and the stochastic, but I've got more tricks up my sleeve. This is actually how you should be doing it. You know, I'm just going to go back here and show you one other thing. And what I do is I take the last swing low right here on the S&Ps. I'll use an index always. And if it's two days out forward, then I'll use either a two period RSI or the best way to do it is against the index, okay, the S&P index. Do relative strength against the S&P index. I don't have that on CQG, but I will show you a chart in just one minute on the trade station. So that is the ideal way to do relative strength against an index. But as a proxy here, I simply looked at going out n number of days from that last swing low. So in this case, if we're three or four days out, I want to see what is best performing three or four days out. If the last swing low was seven days out, I want to see what is best performing seven days out. So I use the number of days back to the most recent swing low as my look back period. And here you can see with the QQQs, basically the NASDAQ, at this data point, we were at 83. And to give you uh, two examples, eBay was at 91, outperforming this index just with a goofy little relative strength reading. And Starbucks was relatively neutral, slightly underperforming it. And which one of these did better on a walk forward basis? So you understand the power of a simple scan for relative strength. Lastly, coming down the home stretch with our horses rounding the corner, I've got this F5 Networks versus Merck, and I wanted to show you two extreme examples of a lame horse versus one that had a healthy dose of oats. And uh, you can see the yellow down here. This is a line that compares the relative strength of the individual market to the S&Ps. And you can see that this particular stock was outperforming the S&Ps the majority of the time since mid-March. Okay, so you had a chance to enter this at 90. It's now 150. Of course, we don't buy the lows, nor do we sell the highs, but you certainly had more of a spread opportunity here than 
Merck, where our relative strength was superior here simply because it was not getting beat up as hard. But when this dropped off the spectrum and started to underperform here, and this is a 10 period look back period, there would be no reason to consider this a long candidate. Okay, so be aware when you are doing your homework, if you are looking for a swing trade or a holding period of longer than two to three days, you need to be really extra cognizant of that relative strength. And as our parting shot, since I have gone 30 minutes here, relative strength works great in the commodity futures and the index futures. And I use that every day. And just for shits and giggles, I plotted this against the S&P. It's a four period relative strength. And I really could not find any commodity futures that were outperforming the S&Ps, okay? The only one I found was the hogs on this shortage here. And you can see the yellow was the period where it was outperforming the S&Ps and this wheat. What a dog, I'm sorry, what a bozo. So that told me, that piece of information told me that short term, there is not the demand factor out there for cash commodities. Things have been shut down. Yes, it's a temporary lull. Hopefully it's not gonna be two years. It'll be one year, maybe two years. I don't know. But you know, all these asset, all these different markets from natural gas to crude oil to, to uh, grains and so forth are really suffering from this major lack of demand yet on the other side of the coin we have this major theme of incredible asset uh, inflation in these financial assets driven by this heroin injection of the fed fed driven by this insane high bearish readings in the sentiment you know, and yet we also saw that smart money in there, all the big macro players who are uh, knowledgeable enough to have 100 billion under management doing their sneaky buying with those closing ticks. And this concludes my presentation. Last slide. Okay, we try to present our analysis in uh, parts as best we can online with me and Damon, and you can always go to our website and we try and uh, make constructive analysis and commentary on the relative strength leaders in the stocks every day and other trade ideas. And I thank you all for participating today. I'm sorry I don't have time for questions because I just ran three minutes over. God bless you all. I hope you had a lovely weekend and you are welcome to email me questions simply going to the contact form on my website, lindarashke.net. Thank you again.